Yes, yes we can sit. sit. Okay. <laughs> Mike says we can sit. Okay. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, <clears throat> I have the honor to be an interviewer tonight. I've never done that before. So uh, I did a little rehearsal. I watched some of Johnny Carson's old, <laughs> old night things. I also looked at Charlie Rose. Didn't want to do it, but I did it. <laughs> and then I ended up with Barbara Walters and uh, came up with a few questions. So I'm going to ask Mr. Marcus, my friend Bernie, uh, some questions. And uh, I've written a whole sheet of them here. We probably won't get through all of them. but You know it's a waste asking me the questions. You're aware of that, right? The what? It's a waste asking me questions. I know it is. But I'm going to try to keep you in line, you know. I mean, I've had Never happened. My, <laughs> no, but give it a shot. Go ahead. OK. So let's start here. Why are you personally so concerned for the survival of the Jewish people and the state of Israel? OK. Can I give a preface first? Before I do that? You can do anything you okay. want. They paid to get in. Um, <laughs> number one, let me just say that um, I am politically incorrect. So I'm going to say things tonight that are going to offend people here. And um, Wait a minute. I see some people leaving already. <laughs> go. <laughs> That's number one. Number two. Um, I want to point a couple of things out, Mike, before we start. Uh, this aquarium, uh, you know that we have the four of the largest whale sharks in the world. No other aquarium in the United States has anything like that. We have belugas, we have um, uh, dolphins, we have uh, just about every fish you can think of. Does anybody here know what this aquarium has that no other aquarium in the world has? Anybody have a clue? Huh? A mezuzah on the front door. That should tell you how I feel about being Jewish and what my, my concern is for Jews. Uh, I don't think there's another public place in the world that has that, and I'm, we're proud of it. So now we can go back to your question. So what was it? Because you have to be careful, Mike. At my age, I forget. By the way, what is your name again? Do you, do you, do you know, this is a 2,000-year-old man situation. Yeah, right. You're the 2,000-year-old man, and right. I'm Kyle Reiner, and you're right. Mel Brooks. Is that what it is? No, it's going to be, it's going to okay. be very close to that. So tonight. what's the most important invention in the last 2,000 years? <laughs> the aquarium. <laughs> <laughs> or Home okay. Depot, anyway. Go ahead. Uh, all right. All right. So, so the question is, why, why you, what, what drives you to be personally concerned about the survival of the Jewish people, one, and survival of the state of Israel, two? Okay. I think that I could answer that by telling a couple of stories, and I think, that, um, I think that's a good idea. Okay. I can answer by a couple of stories. First of all, uh, I remember growing up as a young man in Newark, New Jersey, and uh, being very, very, well, we were kind of poor, lived in the tenement. Um, but that's not the story. Uh, the, the story really begins uh, by the fact that I tried to get into medical school uh, in the early 1950s, and I could not get into medical school because there was a 10% quota on Jewish students. Now, this is our America. This was them. If you go back in history, and you look in 1950, in those years that I remember very, very, I was, I was in the early 20s at that point, um, there were no, you couldn't get into any big corporation. There was no uh, law firm that you could join. There was no stock brokers you could, firm, you could join as a Jew. So the world was closed to us at those, at the, in those days. And lo and behold, something happened in 1948, Mike, and it was the Jewish state. When Israel was formed and they went through that war, the attitude in this country changed dramatically. Suddenly, the Jews that were looked at as lesser people, people that didn't fight for what they wanted, people that were people of the Torah, et cetera, et cetera, but not the strong ones that would support themselves or fight for themselves, suddenly it turned. And I slowly watched, and I, I could do this in retrospect, I watched the attitude in the United States change dramatically, and it did change dramatically. All of a sudden, 
Goliath and David became obvious. And Jews were looked at it with a different light. And the doors opened up, Mike, for everybody. So here we are today in a world where uh, we've been very successful. You can look out at this room, my, all of my friends in Florida, all these very successful business people, all Jewish people who have made a great success of their lives. I don't think they ever stop and think of what this world for us would be like had there been no state of Israel. So my very concern is that I am a realist and I understand that if Israel did not exist today, our lives would not be the same. Now, having said that, the world is changing and it's changing not for the good, but for the worse. It's not going in the direction we would like to. So my concern for Jews is at the highest level it has ever, ever, ever been. And that is alongside the, the state of Israel. So we're living, living in, a, in a world, Mike, that is not a great world for us. And you and I are not going to see the end of this show. But I will tell you that this is a show right now that's not going in the right direction. And I have to tell you this. You and I are entrepreneurs. Both of us are entrepreneurs. We like to go into things. We build things. We know how to grow businesses. We know how to do that. We're basically optimists in almost everything we do. We attend, except golf. That's the only thing I'm not an optimist about. <laughs> but other than golf, I'm basically an optimist, and I think you are also. In this area, I have to tell you, I'm a downer. I'm really a downer. I don't like what's happening, and if you'd like me to go further, I could tell you why. Well, that's going to be the next question, but, okay. but I, I think, I think uh, you and I have talked about this a lot, about the serious nature of the condition of the Jewish people. And we sit in Florida with just with the, with the people you said, uh, wealthy business people who've been successful in the United States because of the American dream and everything else. And, and we're worrying about the future of the Jewish people. But you, you, can, you can tell us why you think that is. But also, I think the people here would like to, like to understand, what is it that the Jewish people have to do to be able to recover 1948, 1967, 1973, when, when the image of Israel and the image of the Jewish people was very significant enough to give you and me and many of the people sitting in this room the kind of opportunities that we've had. So there are two questions. Why is it happening? Why is it happening? And what can we do? OK, what can we do? <clears throat> Why is it happening? Well, that's, that's out of our control. I mean, that has to do with governments. It has to do with politics. It has to do with things that we don't have any control over. But there's some things that we do have control over. Um, I remember when I moved to Atlanta, and when you moved to Atlanta, the first thing you did was to find a synagogue that you were going to go to. You joined a synagogue. That was the way we went. That's what we thought. And whether you're Orthodox or Reform, it made no difference. Everybody belonged to a synagogue. Now, if you look around today, we have assimilation in this country today. And the, old, the generation, my generation, believed that. And then the next generation began to be, slough it off. And it wasn't important. And because they sloughed it off, their children sloughed it off. And today, we're faced with a situation of assimilation that's going on all over this country. And then the, the numbers are staggering on how many are marrying out of, the Jewish, out of the Jewish faith. But things are happening everywhere. And I'll give you a perfect example of it. Something that happened to us in the last couple of weeks. Number one, um, we had the IDF here uh, a week ago, about a week and a half ago. And there was a small protest group that, that came out, and they made a little disturbance. It didn't make any difference. But when we drove up, I saw one little girl with a sign on her, around her neck. And it said, I'm Jewish, and I don't support Israel. OK? That's serious. Daniel Sperling told me a story this week where they did interviews that were behind it. Nobody knew it was happening, right, Daniel? And they gave interviews talking about, and there was a 16-year-old girl who said the following. I'm going to quote you, Daniel. She said, I'm going to be going to college. Nobody will know I'm Jewish. I will not tell anybody I'm Jewish because it's dangerous. Now, I don't remember anything like that happening in my lifetime here in this country, but it's certainly happening. And this is a 
This is something that's going on and it's in the universities today and we don't even know it and we're doing very little about it, Mike. And that's the issue, we're doing very little about it. Most of us, most of us. Some of us are doing something about it, but most of us are not. So what can be done to close the gap about that? I mean, why, we all know this is happening. I can look out at this audience and I can see my children and I can see my grandchildren and they belong to a synagogue and they've been bar mitzvahed and they're practicing and they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, but they're gonna be going to college in a few years and are they gonna have the same fear? Is, is it gonna to continue to exist? What, what, what is it that the Jew, we, we have a strong Jewish community in this country and politically, both parties raise a significant amount of money from the Jewish world, significant. And yet we can't influence the politics. You say it's out of our control. What can we as individuals do? Well, you know, if, the, um, if you add up the amount of money, I think the numbers are very significant. The Jewish population in this country is something like one and a quarter percent, right. something like that. If you look at philanthropy, philanthropy, Jews are somewhere between 15 to 20 percent of all philanthropy is by Jews. So we are, the issues are on universities. If you went to the universities and you looked who the biggest givers in the universities are, I think you would find a disproportionate amount of Jews. I agree. So there you are. We are supporting the people who are our enemies. Because on the campuses today, On the campuses today, we have professors, we have administration, we have Palestinians who are attacking Jewish kids, who are attacking the state of Israel, and by that anti-Semitism, it comes right back to the Jewish kids. And, we, and, and be the, by the way, all these colleges are section uh, Title VIII, which means we're supported by the states and the federal government, and yet they get away with it on every campus, and they can't seem to stop it. So. You say we have the power, that we have an extraordinary amount of influence in politics. Uh, we don't use it in the right way, and many of us are ashamed of it. And there are many Jews who I don't consider Jews. I mean, there are a group, there's a group out there, I will say, again, I'm politically uh, incorrect, called J-Screen, which J I think is J-Street, J J Street, which I think is totally anti-Israel, which is functioning on the, on the campuses and talking about the state of Israel. Now, look, you could say whatever you want about the state of Israel. Um, I don't agree with the state of Israel. Um, I think that many of the policies they do are wrong. Um, we have in Israel gangsters, we have drug dealers, we have dishonest lawyers, but we have them here too, so that's not a big deal. Uh, but you have taxi drivers, you got garbage collectors, you got people that sweep the street, but they're all Jews, they're all Jews. And it's like that world is a Jewish world. Um, you don't have to agree with it. Listen, I have a lot of problem with this country. I don't trust the IRS. I think it's corrupt. I think the SEC is corrupt. I think the, I think the Justice Department is corrupt. Um, that doesn't mean that I don't love this country. One thing is not the same. I disagree with many of the policies in Israel. And I disagree with many of the policies here. It doesn't mean I'm less of that. So why, why Jews, knowing that 8 million Jews are dependent on them, and I mean dependent on them, one bomb, one holocaust can take them all out at one time. Why Jews support issues that are anti-Israel is just beyond me. I just don't get it. I don't get it. Uh, let me ask you a secular question. Do you still have faith in the American dream? Yeah, I think, yeah. But, I, you know, people have to be bright enough. Um, I think the American dream, I think the American people are entrepreneurial. I think they are people who are, um, want to be their own bosses, want to learn uh, things, want to open things, want to do things. Um, and pardon me for saying this, God, I know it's terrible, it's the worst thing, but they want to get rich. <laughs> they want to get rich. Everybody wants to have money. Everybody wants to have the good things in life. But you can't get those things unless you work for it. And I think that 
And I've said this many times. I've said this on TV. I've said it on radio. I've said it all the time. At Home Depot, which is one of the great Cinderella stories of all time, the fastest growing retail company, came out of no one. Three Jews and an Irishman and, and an Italian that decided to open in the city, uh, you know, in 1978. And look what happened with it. I mean, now there are 400,000 people working there. There are just, uh, you know, billions of dollars of net worth, et cetera, et cetera. That was the American dream. But we didn't have a government that stopped us. We had a government that encouraged us in those days. Today, it is so difficult. If we tried to open a Home Depot today with a new idea that Home Depot was, it was a new strategy, it was a, no, it was a dream, actually. We invented that business, that big store business. If we tried to open that today, we could not do it because of all the regulation. I could give you uh, Dodd-Frank, uh, surveys Oxley, uh, the litigation, uh, the SEC, the, uh, the, uh, we could never open a store. You can't open a store today. We have a store in New York that we've been trying to open for 12 years. 12 years. We can't get through the regulations for 12 years. Now, the area that we want to open it, they need a Home Depot desperately. They really do, because we bring cheaper prices, we bring things that they never had before, and create jobs, by the way. But the regulations are disastrous, and they've gotten worse over the last six, seven years, and uh, I don't see them turning unless there's an election coming up in 2016. I hope the American people are bright enough and smart enough to do the right thing. So, well, let, me, let me ask you a question, uh, sort of a personal question, Bernie. Uh, and a lot of people ask me questions about, you know, who taught you, where did you learn, what drove you, et cetera. Was there one person in your life that really put you on the right road? Uh, to what? To Jewishness? To, 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 Jew, to, to everything. To who you are as a person. Who would you credit the most? You know, I, I, I honestly have to tell you it's a combination of many people, lots of people. Um, when I go back, and you know I talk about it all the time, I never forget people who have helped me in the, in the early years. Uh, there are people that uh, you know, I don't see anymore that, that I, I always refer to as we would never be successful without them. And uh, you know, that's why I love the associates at Home Depot. And I can walk in the store, I hug and kiss them. I don't have to worry about sexual harassment anymore, so I can kiss them all. <laughs> um, you know, if I had done that when I was there, I'd be arrested and put, thrown in jail. And, <laughs> That's what the laws have come to. It's such bullshit, it's unbelievable. So, you know. um, but, you know, I love them because they, they, they made me who I am. I, 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 they, by their working and by their putting out and, and taking care of the customers every day, so I'm obligated to them. But in my life, I had lots of people. Uh, Billy, I think, has played a very important role keeping me stable. I mean, just keeping me stable. She could tell you I was a nutcase many years ago. Oh, I, I can tell you that's uh, hard. That's she hard. called me a hilaria, whatever that is. What does that mean? <laughs> um, but, but I think that uh, going back, uh, it was many, many people. Uh, Mike, you, you had an influence on me. Uh, uh, people have influences on you. And you can't, if, if it's only one person, unfortunately, when that person goes, you're, you're dead in the water. Um, there are a confluence of people that every single day of my life I meet that affect me somehow. Uh, doesn't mean it's the only effect on me, but I watch lots of people. I mean, I've had the occasion uh, by being where I am today, meeting some great, wonderful people, like a guy like George Schultz. I mean, that, that's an experience in a lifetime, having met him and spent you know, meaningful hours with him. Uh, that was very, very important to me. Uh, some of the people in Israel, uh, unfortunately, one has gone to jail, Omer. I mean, you know, he's a prime minister of Israel, but he was a great thinker and a great philosopher. And uh, he, he, um, he taught me a lot of things. So it's a lot of people. Jay Kamen doesn't know it, but he affects my life constantly. Okay? He affects a lot of people's lives. So, <laughs> lots, lots of people. Great. Okay, good. That's very good. I think that's very good. What you're saying, if I could summarize it, is that Anybody can really have an influence. It could be a negative influence, it could be a positive influence, but you're able to take from other people what they have to offer. 
I think from an advice standpoint, that's really pretty good, isn't it? I mean, that's what you're saying. You don't be with one person as one mentor, but look around and see what you can learn from other people. You know, an interesting fact that I, I'm a great believer in this, that every day of your life, if every day of your life you learn a new thing, it has two things. Number one, it tells you that you're still listening. And the other one is tells you how dumb you were the day before. <laughs> and yeah, that's great. believe me when I tell you, that is a, that's a truism. And I go through every, I can tell you at the end of the day what I learned that day that I never knew before. It's almost every single day of my life. And it makes me want to stay here and wait for tomorrow. And that's, that's why I'm here. Just tomorrow, what am I going to learn? Are you going to teach me something tonight? <laughs> I hope. Well, I'm going to try. I'm going to okay. try. Um, can you tell me why you chose me to run the aquarium? <laughs> Nobody, everybody else turned it down. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, we needed somebody here uh, that uh, knows how to deal with people. You know, Mike, uh, when, when young people, I, I speak to a lot of colleges and I speak to a lot of young uh, uh, classes of young people, and they say to me, what is, the, what is the biggest lesson? What is the one thing I have to do in my life? And I say, you have to learn how to communicate with people. That's the first thing. And communication means being able to uh, speak intelligently and make your point, but more importantly, to listen to what they have to say. And many people think that communication is somebody like Obama, who talks and doesn't listen, okay? Uh, they think that that's the way it goes. And, and by the way, if you, if, you, if, you, if you understand I'm taking shots all night, that, 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 hey, listen, that's who I am. And, and I mean every one of them. So, <laughs> but having said that, um, it's listening that's, that's a key factor. You are a great listener, but you're also a great teacher and a communicator. And what we needed here, we think it's a great place. Uh, we have over, what, two, over two million people a year coming through yes, here. Yes, two million. I think yeah. we've already had, what, 22 million, something like that, come through here. I think the number is somewhere around 22. About. Of which 50% come from this market and 50% come from all over the world. And so we have some very uh, special people here. We have people who are veterinarians. You, you heard this. Oh, you didn't hear the story. We, we're doing a colonoscopy of, of the new baby uh, beluga today. Uh, oh, my, no, it's an ultrasound, but that's close. Know, whatever actually. it is. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what the distance is, actually. Do they, do they know that we could do a colonoscopy of a, oh, yeah. of a yeah. whale shark? Yeah. We actually got this tube that's out, runs out 20 feet. So yeah. anybody here that's got a problem, Don't we, can, we can handle you. No matter how big you are. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, we could double it up and go in. So, <clears throat> but I think that, you know, Mike, you, you made a special thing. You came in and you brought a lot of good sense here. Uh, and this, this aquarium could accommodate a lot more people, a lot more people, and give it the uh, staying power. Uh, somebody asked me a question before at the uh, little meeting inside and why we charge as much as we do. Uh, actually, uh, we don't charge as much as any other place in the city of Atlanta or anywhere else. It's really in line with everybody else. But you have to understand that some of the things that we do at this aquarium nobody knows about. Uh, you could tell them about it, like the research. Sure. Tell them about the research. Sure, we do a tremendous amount of research and conservation work. We send people all over the world. We just brought back somebody who uh, tagged 20 manta rays in Mexico last week. Uh, we had somebody up in Alaska working with uh, uh, walruses uh, that were beached and, and trying to save baby walruses from being eaten by, uh, by the local tribe. We had people in California with, with the seal, sea lion rescues. Uh, we write about uh, 10 of 12 papers a year of uh, dolphin examinations and we do dolphin uh, research uh, here and in marine land Florida. We do an enormous amount of research and conservation planning here. We don't talk that much about it, but you and I have already talked about the fact that we have to talk more about it. 
we do that. People, uh, people don't, we do get some donations for it, but most of it is financed by the aquarium itself through our admissions. And uh, we're, staffed, uh, we're staffed with a, a serious amount of veterinarians and marine biologists, and we do an awful lot. We're, right now we're in the process of uh, trying to teach a 500-pound turtle not to bite people when we put him in the tank. I have some people yeah. I'd like to throw in that tank with. That's right. <laughs> but if you, if you <laughs> try to teach a turtle new tricks, that's a good one. <laughs> but but uh, there's a lot of special stuff that goes on here with a lot of special people. And I think people underestimate the fact, Bernie, that, that your gift to this aquarium, which was very significant and w without it would never have been built, uh, was a gift to the city of Atlanta as a payback, as a return to the city of Atlanta for its people who actually staffed your stores, and the people you just talked about who staffed your stores, and you wanted to give it back to them and their families so that Atlanta could have a place that, would, would, that was generated by the largesse that came from the success yeah. of Home Depot. And I think that th this is the single largest tourist attraction in Atlanta by far. Over two million people visit, compared to other museums and, and institutions over here that are in the less than a million. So, uh, and most are less than 500,000. Some are even less than 200,000. So that gift was a return. And maybe that comes to the next question is, what is it, what is it inside you that, that is what I call the give back quotient? What drives the giving back that puts you in a position so differently than so many others in your same category? Well, I, I tell the story many years ago when I was uh, in California and I had a young man come to me and tell me that, um, and he was a pretty important guy, uh, came to me, had tears in his eyes, and he said to me, I just want to come and say goodbye to you because I'm, I'm dying, I'm going to die. And I said, what do you mean you're going to die? And he said, I'm going to die within six weeks to seven weeks. And um, I said, well, what, what do you have? He said, I have cancer. And the, doc the doctor said, uh, go, go home, take care of your will, take care of your family. You have six weeks to live. Goodbye. I'll see you. You know, at the funeral. Um, and honestly, in those words, just about as close as possible. And at that time, I was associated. Um, I knew about a place called the City of Hope in California, and um, I had participated with a company that we had uh, that ran a fundraiser for them. I didn't know anything about it really, but I, the president, had given me his card, <clears throat> and I called him up, and I, uh, I said, I had this young man thinks he's going to die. They said, send him over right away. Send him over. Uh, the end of the story is that they saved his life. He's alive today, by the way. Um, but that's the first time that I ever knew that I could be responsible for saving a human life. I didn't do it. They did it, obviously, but my getting him into this place and the kind of, of joy that I got from that is the kind of joy that I, have, I actually get from almost everything that we participate in. Uh, building you know, the Marcus Autism Center. Uh, we see children that we're saving you know, constantly. Um, I, I, just about everything that we do uh, has an end point of touching people's lives. And Billy and I, when we see the face of people that we've had an impact on, it makes such such an impression on us. Um, and as a businessman, you know, you're always worried about you know, what you're going to make the quarter, what you're going to make, you know, have a good year, you're going to have a good month, or, et cetera. There was never, ever a feeling that equaled that of saving a life or having or changing the direction of a family. I mean, that's such an impactful in your life. So I, I spend a lot of time talking to people and tell them, that there's a joy in giving, a tremendous joy in giving, that uh, you have to do and you have to feel it yourself. And I say always involve yourself in something where you could see who the recipient is so you understand what it's like. When somebody comes up to you and shakes your hand, I just, we, we just had it tonight. Somebody came up to me, one of, the, one of the rabbis, and said a dear friend is in Shepherd. And, and the kind of work that they're doing at Shepherd. Well, Billy and I have been involved, and Billy was raised, I cannot tell you how much money for Shepherd. Uh, and we hear those stories, and it just makes an impact on us. Uh, and we're not impervious to it after all these years. 
It's more meaningful as we get older. Um, I think we're kind of reaching the time. At 10 past 8, we're supposed to be finished with this, I guess, to be on time. We've got a couple more minutes. I wonder if you'd mind if I told this a little story about you. Before, before you do it, before you do it, we're going to finish. I've got a couple of things I have to say. I have to say, first of all, this is important. This is a Jewish community, okay? Michael Morris, where's Michael? My son, Michael, is the, is the editor, is the publisher of the Jewish Times. Now, you all know the Jewish Times, okay? And this is my commercial for Michael for coming up here, by the way. This is my commercial. That I think that every Jew, if you all talk about committing and meeting and being part of the community, how important it is. I think that this is a very significant opportunity. When I, years ago, the Jewish Times was always important in our lives and something happened over the years, it just dissipated, it lost its value, it lost its meaning to lots of people here. It's time to go, it's $65, send in some money and get into it, okay? Jewish Times. Now you can ask me the question. You can take whatever you want. I want to finish this by telling a story that very few people know that has to do with myself and Bernie. And uh, I'll let Bernie drink some water, and then he, he won't have anything else to say after this, after I tell him this story, and then we can finish. In uh, January of 2009, I was at a board meeting uh, in uh, Las Vegas uh, as a board of directors meeting. Uh, Las Vegas Sands was a company that stock was about $1.40, and the company was in serious trouble. And Sheldon Adelson uh, called me into his office, and he offered me the job of going to be president and chief operating officer of Las Vegas Sands. Uh, I said no. And he said, why? And I said, I'm too old. Uh, and he said, no, you're not. And his wife said to me, well, why don't you go home and think about it? So I said, OK, I'll go home for the weekend and I'll think about it. At that time, I was the uh, chief CEO here at the aquarium, working for Bernie. And I knew how important the aquarium was to Bernie. So that was a, that was a little bit of a, a difficult decision for me to try to make. So I came home. And there were really two advisors for me. Uh, one is my wife, who's sitting here tonight, Andrea, for 54 years of advice and still giving it, <laughs> and, and including what, what shirt I have to wear tonight and what belt I have to wear, et cetera, <laughs> and, uh, and Bernie. And I came home that night, and I, uh, I said to Andrea that uh, I had a job offer uh, to go to Las Vegas. And, and give up the aquarium and, and go to Las Vegas. And, and she said, uh, well, she first turned about as white as the sheet of paper that she was looking at, uh, didn't say anything. And then <clears throat> we went to bed that night, and I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I looked over my right shoulder, because I sleep on the left side. And, uh, um, and I noticed she was up looking at the ceiling, and I said, uh, why, why are you up? And she said, why are you up? And uh, I said, well, I'm thinking. And she said, well, I think you should take that job. And I said, why? She says, well, I think you should take it. So I said, well, in order for me to take it, I have to talk to Bernie. So the next morning, I called Bernie. And I said, I want to come down and see you. I got something I want to talk about. He said, well, come on. So the next day was Sunday. I flew down to Boca Raton in St. Andrews. And uh, Bernie, this was his old house, not the house he has now. And I went in and I sat in the office waiting for him. And I was with great trepidation and fear because I didn't know what he was going to say or do. And he walked into the office and he sat behind his desk. And I was sitting on the couch in front of him. And he said, why are you here? And I said, I have an offer. And he looked at me sort of sternly, not like he's looking now, but sternly. And he said, uh, did you take it? And I said, no, I came here to talk to you about it. So he said, I think you should take it. So I said, what are you going to do if I take it? He said, I'll have to work harder at the aquarium if you take it. 
And I said to him, well, why? Why is it that you want me to take this job? And I think this tells you a little bit about the gentleman that's sitting next to me that you probably don't know. Well, you do know, really. He said, if you take the job, it'll be good for the United States of America, and it'll be good for the state of Israel. Because the guy you're working for needs you to make a lot of money so he can give it away for both the United States and the state of Israel. Now, that's not something that people say, uh, not they think about at the moment. It's something that's on their mind, and that's how important it is, both the United States and the state of Israel. So he put, a, put the, uh, I guess what you call it, the, some kind of a curse on me to go and uh, take the job just by saying that. So I said, well, okay. I said, well, I guess I gotta take it. He said, wait a minute. He held up his hand and he said, there are a couple of conditions. <clears throat> the first condition is that if you're successful, you'll move to St. Andrews in Florida. I said, well, I figure the job can't be done. It'll never happen, so I won't have to move to Florida in the wintertime, whatever. And then he said, the next condition is, I will negotiate your deal for you. <laughs> because you've never negotiated a good deal for yourself <laughs> in all the years I've known you. <laughs> then he said to me, make up, let's make up the list. And we sat there and we made up a list of about 10 or 12 different things that had to be in this thing. Then he said, okay, you asked for all of this, all of this, and if they're not giving this and this, this and that, then you call me up and I'll tell you what to do. <laughs> so I said, okay, what do I have to lose? So we went through the whole process, the whole process with Sheldon's negotiator and whatever it is, and we got hung up on one item, which is very interesting, at the very end. Because, because Bernie was holding out for a guarantee if in fact the company didn't make it. And uh, I said, I can't ask for a guarantee of the company. He said, you will ask for the guarantee, and that's it, that's part of the deal. So I went back and I asked, and I was told, well, it couldn't really be done in writing, but it could be done with a handshake. So I went back to Bernie and said, can I take Sheldon Adelson's handshake? And he said, yes. I took the handshake, the rest is history. I moved to Vegas for six years, almost six years. And the stock went where? The stock went up to $83 from the dollar fifty. And, uh, uh, and I built a house in St. Andrews, and I'm back at the aquarium. <laughs> because that wasn't part of the deal. <laughs> but the, thing, the reason I want to leave you with that story to be right on time here is when you think about the unselfishness, in business, most of you who are in business see that stuff, self, how selfish. In the case of leaving the aquarium was going to put a bigger burden on Bernie than he had. And it did, in fact, put a bigger burden, bigger burden on Bernie than he had. That wasn't in the way. When it came to helping the United States and Israel and the faith he had that we could turn that company around, which amazed me to this day how we knew it could happen, that's what, that's what kind of a person Bernie Marcus is. And that's the person you're honoring tonight at Colel, not just for what he gives, but for who he is. I think that's important, and we'll finish on that topic. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I love you, <laughs>